So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandra Smith, and I'm the faculty chair of the program in criminal justice. You are now attending the final uh, event of this speaker series um, that the program in criminal justice has put on, organized by myself and my co-organizer, Christopher Winship. So I should say that the idea for today's panel developed last fall in conversation with Professor Cornell Brooks. During that conversation, uh, Professor Brooks described to me an incredible class that he was teaching. It's called Creating Justice in Real Time, Visions, Strategies, and Campaigns. In that class, he said, a very select cohort of roughly 30 students were grouped into teams that had as their mission to develop visions, campaigns, as well as legislative policy, best practice, organizing, communication, and moral framing strategies to address injustices related to police brutality in COVID-19. While some groups of students worked with state governments, others worked with mayors and municipal governments. The latter were tasked with informing mayors' efforts to reimagine policing and emergency response. During that conversation, I mentioned to Professor Brooks that it would be exciting to have the mayors who were in, involved with uh, this course um, at the speaker series, that it would be wonderful to have them join us to, to share in their experiences, not just related to the class, but what kinds of efforts they were engaged in in their own cities around this particular issue. Um, so we invited mayors Joseph Curtitoni, um, Kathy Sheehan, and Randolph Woodfin to, from, from uh, Somerville, Massachusetts, Albany, New York, and Birmingham, Alabama to join us today. And they each um, responded in the affirmative, as you can see. And um, I believe our, yes, um, Mayor Woodfin is now in the room. So let me introduce you to each of our mayors. And then um, we, as usual, we will begin um, with, the, with my conversation with each of our mayors. Um, during the conversation, please feel free to um, add questions to the chat because once we open it up for Q&A, we will take the questions as they come in the chat. Um, so first off, we have Professor, uh, professor. We have Mayor Joseph Curtitoni. He was first inaugurated in 2004, becoming at age 37, the second youngest mayor in Somerville's history. Now in his ninth term, he is the city's longest serving chief executive. Curtitoni um, previously uh, served for eight years as alderman at large. My understanding is that after this, this term, um, Mayor Kurt Curtitoni will be stepping down. Um, as mayor, he has implemented, implemented a wide range of reforms and new programs that have earned both him and the city widespread recognition. A sampling of that recognition includes early in his administration, the Boston Globe declared Somerville the best run city in Massachusetts, um, which I think is probably saying a lot. Um, uh, Mayor Curtitoni also is credited with a successful full-scale reform of the Somerville Police Department. As one of his first efforts, he established a, a police a, a policy advisory commission headed by former Attorney General Scott Harsberger, Harsberger um, to develop a comprehensive reform agenda for the Somerville Police, including the decision to remove the position of police chief from civil service. Uh, Mayor Curtis Tony uh, has been a stalwart supporter of numerous social justice initiatives and causes, whether that be sanctuary cities, Black Lives Matter, same-sex marriage, LGBTQ rights, um, or other initiatives that he has stood by um, his support despite significant blowback. Um, in 2020, he was among the first mayors in the nation to declare sy systemic racism a public health crisis and has marshaled resources to address this public health health emergency. Welcome, Mayor Curtitoni. Thanks, uh, Sandra, to you and Chris for having me here and everybody tuning in. Looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely, so am I. Uh, Mayor Kathy, Kathy Sheehan um, is in her second term as Albany, New York's 75th mayor. Um, uh, mayor Sheehan has served as a four-year term um, served a four-year term as Albany's treasurer, treasurer prior to being elected mayor. 
implementing changes to improve the city's fiscal um, policies and overhaul the city, city's parking ticket system. Before serving in elected office, uh, Mayor Xi'an was the vice president, general counsel, and corporate secretary of a publicly traded medical device um, manufacturer. Under Mayor Xi'an's leadership, the city adopted its first new zoning code in more than half a century, secured millions of dollars in funding for workforce development, and became the third city in the U.S. to implement law enforcement assisted diversion, which provides alternatives to arrest for certain nonviolent offenders. Mayor Xi'an implemented to traffic calming initiatives to make Albany's streets safer for pedestrians and cyclists alike, launched a, a new $1 million vacant building rehabilitation program and a $1.5 million poverty reduction initiative, led the steady transformation of the city's downtown into a new urban neighborhood, renovated more than a dozen parks, um, dozen parks across Albany, and revamped the award-winning summer youth employment program. Welcome, uh, Mayor Sheehan. And then finally, Mayor Rand Randall Woodfin was sworn in as the 30th mayor of Birmingham, Alabama on November 28th, 2017. His dedication to his hometown and to others developed when he was 15 years old and was working as a bagger at a Birmingham supermarket. He was, it, was this, it was the place where Mayor Woodfin learned the importance of putting people first, a concept he, he carried on to Morehouse College, then to law school, and finally into his career. Today, that message is at the core of his administration. But those words are more than a slogan or a theme. Putting people first is a strategy representing Mayor Woodfin's mission to build the best version of Birmingham it can be. To make Birmingham a laboratory for progress, the mayor is focused on revitalizing the city's 99 neighborhoods, enhancing education and career opportunities for students, and creating an innovative economic climate to grow, attract, and retain talent, startups, and small businesses. Mayor Woodfin's leadership is already transforming futures. His vision to create new education and career opportunities for students led to the Birmingham Promise, a public-private partnership that provides tuition assistance to cover college costs for Birmingham um, high school graduates. Apprenticeships also provide students with jobs and career experience to prepare them for post-graduation employment opportunities. Um, Mayor Woodfin, welcome to the program in criminal justice. So let us begin um, with a, a, a question to all of you. Um, perhaps we can start with uh, Mayor Curtatoni, our neighbor. Um, first, can you, perhaps you wouldn't mind taking a minute to tell us a, a little bit about your city. Um, um, please do go first, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Curtatoni. Thanks, Sandra, sure. Um, for those of you who don't know Somerville, uh, it is the, uh, the most densely populated city uh, in New England. We have more than 81,000 people and only 4.1 square miles. Uh, we've always been a diverse city uh, for newcomers, for immigrants like my family, who immigrated from Italy. When I was growing up, it was more you know, European immigrants, whether they be from Italy, São Miguel in Portugal, or Greece, or Ireland. And uh, growing up here, we eventually became home to uh, more than 52 languages from countries along the world, around the world in our neighborhoods and our school. But I was in Somerville, and if you've been to Somerville, if this was the New York metro area, you would think of it as Brooklyn. It's hip, it's cool, it's, ever, it's creative, it's culturally vibrant, uh, and it's connected. That, that, that I've seen you know, over the years, how even though we're Somerville, uh, we're still a part of these, one of the neighborhoods in Boston. And even in Somerville, we were a segregated city. Um, and I saw that firsthand uh, in my schools and, and in the neighborhoods here. Um, I've seen how, in the context of policing, what it was like growing up here, how it was feeling uh, when we took office, how, we, how that has changed. Uh, I see how the, the struggle for social progress and, um, and, uh, and, and equity is alive and well in our city. And, uh, but at the same time, how the voices with the, the best perspective and closest to the pain of the lack of that progress and equity aren't always brought to the forefront. That being said, I am proud to be part of a community that we dubbed the most progressive uh, community in Massachusetts, maybe one of the most in the country. Now, in the context of this conversation, I, I'm excited and hope and going to push us all to live up to those ideals in action and not just in slogans. So, um, a little bit about my city. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Um, so, how about you, Mayor Sheehan? Why don't you tell us a little bit about Albany, New York? 
Well, Albany is the capital of this New York State. And so this is a place where, um, you know, uh, the seat of, of New York State government is that has lots of impacts on our city. Um, you know, for those who, who use the term Albany in the state, they're usually referring to the dysfunction that many people are frustrated with in state government. But for those of us who live here, this is a city of neighborhoods. Um, this is a, a city that, uh, you know, I often say tells the story of America from, you know, fur trade to nanotechnology, but everything in between. Um, this is a place where slaves were held. This is a place um, that was home to families that, that uh, you know, uh, it, it participated in the Great Migration North. Um, and this is a city that suffers from the impacts of redlining and of um, you know, the concentration of poverty and the, the um, disinvestment of services uh, in many of our neighborhoods. And so, uh, you know, we really, um, I think, embody many of the challenges that we see across the country. This is a city that We'll wait and see what the final census numbers are, but that is coming close to being a majority minority city. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's important to ensure that we're engaging diverse voices at the table and that we're leading with equity and with a, a, a commitment to ensuring that it's, it's, uh, it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to do the hard work of addressing structural racism, of addressing the challenges that continue to exist in our neighborhoods, um, and and the, the lack of investment and the lack of resources um, that were drained from these communities for decades. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do that work and to continue that work. And it's challenging work and it's hard work and it comes with a lot of controversy and a, a lot of people who, um, you know, are, are, are of differing voices. And it's, um, you know, important that we allow those voices space to be heard. Um, but also get about the hard work of actually doing the transformative work that needs to be done. Thank you, Mayor Sheehan. And Mayor Woodfin, why don't you tell us a little bit about Birmingham? Birmingham. Uh, first of all, let me say uh, good afternoon to everyone. And thanks for allowing me to be with you all this, this afternoon. And to my two fellow mayors, it's good to see you both, especially you, Kathy, my classmate. Um, I will tell you that in one minute or less, right? Because we don't have a lot of time to give you everything about Birmingham. Birmingham is the largest city in the state of Alabama. Uh, we have a metro area of about 1.3 million people. Um, it is a foodie town. There's a lot of history here, um, not just from a civil rights um, movement standpoint, um, but dating back to the just steel industry, et cetera. We fast forward to 2021, um, our city um, is rooted in logistics as well as um, healthcare. Um, our city literally has four major interstates, three major rail lines, an inland port that runs through our city. And so um, we have seen a, a huge increase in, in logistics as well as um, southern research. And so the, the advancements in personalized medicine and where healthcare meets biotech is going, uh, that's our identity. Um, related, to, related to our demographics, we are the fourth blackest city in America. Uh, a city made up of 23 communities and 99 neighborhoods. Um, unfortunately, we have a significant poverty rate and I spent a considerable amount of my time trying to improve the quality of life of the citizens of Birmingham. Short version. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, for, uh, Professor. I keep wanting to call everyone Professor Mayor Woodfin. Um, so as uh, Mayor Woodfin mentioned, we don't have a lot of time and we have three panelists that we really want to engage deeply. So I'm going to cut, cut to the chase and get to some of the more difficult questions, um, especially during this very diff difficult time. So in many cities across the country, relations between police and the communities of color and their communities of color are extremely poor. Um, in reports that uh, Kennedy School students produced about each of their cities, um, they described high levels of distrust um, in vulnerable communities toward police that were often rooted in generations of deeply troubling encounters. Perhaps this is especially so and very in, in a very tense moment um, right now in Albany, uh, Mayor Sheehan. Um, and so I, I'm going to want for each of you all to, to, to respond to these questions, but I will start with Mayor Sheehan. Um, how would you describe the quality of relations between your police agency and, and your residents of color? Where do things stand now? 
I mean, I would say that they are very frayed. And, you know, the thing about Albany is that because we're the capital, um, you know, we, we also are a center for protest. So people come here from other communities to protest. Um, and so, you know, it's balancing the needs of and, and, the, and the desires of our residents, as well as the broader voices that are demanding change that don't necessarily um, live here in this community, so aren't necessarily as involved in sort of the day-to-day -day work that we're doing to transform our police department. But one of the things that I think is really important for all of us to recognize is that this isn't about individual police officers. This is about changing a ra structurally racist system. And in order to change a system, it takes a tremendous amount of work on the part of community, on the part of our partners in the community, and on the part of our police department. And it, it, it is about more than one officer. I'll give you an example. We have officers who are going to be disciplined. We had a, an incident just this past week and there were officers who covered their badge numbers. That is not okay. That erodes trust. It is not something I support. It is something I am, you know, I, I, I'm appalled by, right? And, and that undermines trust in the community. And, and we have to, you know, bring discipline to that. But we also recently received what I consider to be one of the most racist arbitration decisions I've ever read uh, in a case where we terminated an, a police officer who blatantly violated the Fourth Amendment rights of Black individuals living in our West Hill neighborhood. And the arbitrator not only is requiring us to rehire this individual, but made the decision that we shouldn't have provided him with any discipline at all. And so there are structures that are beyond the power of a mayor or even our police chief that continue to stand in the way of creating um, the, a police department that reflects what our community wants. So um, in, in response to that, uh, it doesn't occur to me, Mayor Sheehan, that anyone is uh, arguing that this is about any one officer. In fact, most of the arguments I hear made, it's about the institution itself. And it's also about uh, the, those who are in, in positions that, like the one that you hold. Um, many members of your community, I have no idea who came in to engage in protest, but many members of your own community from the black community um, would like you to step down in addition to the chief of police because they find that they cannot trust you any more than they can trust the police, that you have not been listening, you have not been engaging, um, and you were complicit in the attack that happened against the, the encampment of black actors. Activists. And people are up in arms about this. And so while you talk about the need to lead with equity, about hearing multiple voices, no one saw the action of those your police officers um, um, very recently and see that as evidence of this. It feels like you perhaps are talking with two faces. And so I think a lot of people want to understand exactly what is happening because you're saying one thing, the actions look very different. And, and in this day and age, when we're interested in transformational change, the behavior of your police force and the, your, your response to it by associating those black protesters with people who stormed the Capitol, is completely out of hand. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you help us to make sense of what seems to be very troubling behavior consistent with all of the trouble, but troubling behavior we've been protesting against? You have been aligned with that. You have been identified as your, um, among your community members as being a problem that, and you're not producing solutions. So this is what we need to hear. So I think that when, um, you know, in, in placing this in context, we have a group of protesters who came to the city from outside the community to protest something that happened in Minneapolis, and not in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, um, the most, the, a, a, a police shooting. Mayor Sheehan, Mayor Sheehan, I, what, does it make a difference whether they live in Albany or they live somewhere else? The I, way that you know, those police battered those black protesters, I don't give, I don't care where they lived. That was inappropriate behavior. That was unethical. It was likely getting going against the constitutional rights. You keep making this distinction about them living somewhere else. It seems. It seems very troubling and problematic. So, you know, as a mayor, we have to deal with the uh, all 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 members of our community, and so we have individuals who came 
Uh, there was a, 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 an incident that occurred and they were, their, their demand was that we fire a police officer. So it was about an individual police officer. Um, and they, they were going to encamp until I resigned, the police chief resigned and the police officer was terminated. This encampment continued to grow. Um, they, it started with uh, um, protesters and then it grew to tents. They were blocking a, a, a street in front of South Station. They were making it impossible for service, for delivery of services to a homeless shelter that was right next door to where the encampment was. And we had to make a decision about um, allowing peaceful protesting to happen and opening our streets. And uh, ultimately, as the days progressed and as the community in and around that area made their voices heard, the chief made the decision that we needed to move the tents so that we could open the street. We, we communicated that to the protesters. We ex explained to them that there was an area where they could continue to peacefully protest, but that they could no longer occupy a city street with their encampment. And unfortunately, that resulted in arrests because there were individuals who did not want to abandon their encampment. Um, you know, the balance between opening a public street, making a homeless shelter that serves hundreds of individuals accessible to its employees and its delivery people are all of the things and, and challenges that we had to balance. So I think two things can be true, right? It's traumatic to see people arrested. It is traumatic to, to see, uh, you know, police officers have to go in and make these arrests. And it was also very disruptive in the neighborhood and what we were hearing from people in the neighborhood that they wanted to see this encampment removed so that they could access their homes and their streets and they could access services. It's, it, these are challenging, difficult decisions. Um, and uh, you know, I understand that there are people who are upset about how it was happening. Um, and I, you know, I, there are those who are of course gonna say, uh, you know, this was something that was supported. We received dozens and dozens of calls and emails from people who wanted to see that encampment removed because of the disruption that it was causing to a neighborhood. These are tough choices. And our officers, I'm just gonna make it very clear, any officer who covered their badge was violating our city policy, they were violating state law and they will be disciplined. So um, there have been reports well before the police officer uh, killed someone and was, uh, and there were protests to have him arrested. There were uh, reports made by organizations, local organizations highlighting the really tense, troubling relationship between the Black community in Albany and the police. So this go this extends well before this particular incident. And I think that if you see this as a situation of one officer, I don't think that you're understanding the problem um, well. And then I have to ask, then I have to, and then I have to, I have to share that it wasn't so much the arrests that were troubling, it was the battering with the clubs that was troubling um, to my eyes. Um, the, the physical violence that I saw that was troubling. I think it's interesting that you keep characterizing this in terms of simple arrests. Um, and then it makes one wonder if there were no other ways to address this, to come to some resolution so that everyone felt like they were heard without black citizens getting brutalized. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's some real questions that you need to, 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 uh, to, to think about deeply. Of course, these are hard issues. This is politics, but to go to battering black bodies again, and it, in, in whatever context, this is troubling, but to do it in this context, especially as you're positioning yourself as someone who is seeking racial equity and leading with equity, it, 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 seems, it seems problematic. Um, and to be honest with you, I think I can understand why there would be a fair measure of distrust. Um, there, there you, I'm sure that you have other things that you would like to share with regards to this issue, um, but nationwide people are very up in arms with what happened in your characterization. Well, I, I, I would just caution people that, that are looking at, at, uh, at, you know, at social media that, you know, the, the challenge with this work is that if we want to change the culture of policing, we have to work within 
the we have to work to break down right what is happening and how that system is built. And I believe that we don't we don't um, you know you, you cannot reform education without talking to teachers. You cannot reform healthcare without talking to nurses. And you cannot reform policing without talking to police officers. And there was no room for conversation. There was no room for uh, space to have constructive conversations like the one that we're trying to have here. Our police officers were met with verbal abuse, and I and you know there was no space to have productive conversation. And that is what is going to bring transformative change. And that is what we are working on with people who are, you know, we, we had, we went through a multi-month process of a policing collaborative with diverse voices at the table. We had over 63 meetings. We had hundreds of comments. We had 14 hours of public comment. This is hard work. And there needs to be space for conversation with one another, as opposed to screaming at one another. And it sounds like very few in your community feel like you're actually having that conversation because no one trusts you. Um, so it, 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 I think it, 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 it certainly is, has to be difficult uh, what it is that you're trying to do. Um, yeah, but no, I just have to push the, back on you, 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 this characterization that no one in this community trusts me. You know, I think in the, in the black community, there has been a, there have been lots of reports, both official and by regular citizens to highlight the very tense relationships that they root, not just in the police and the chief of police, but also in their relationship with you. So I'm just gonna move on to other folks. I'm really interested in what is happening um, with, in Birmingham um, with uh, Mayor Woodfin. Here too, histories of problematic relationships. Do you wanna share with us what the quality um, of relations are between the police agency and residents of color? Where do things stand now? Yeah, well, um, you know, my philosophy is as mayors, uh, we have a choice. We can either lead on police reform or we can, um, I guess, come in kicking, screaming and being dragged into reform because of reacting to a situation that's either out of line or out of policy. And so from my standpoint, it goes back to 1979, um, where a white officer shot and killed an unarmed black female. Um, and so what we're seeing in, in the last few years, an unarmed black man being killed and shot by um, white officers is not new um, to our community. That being the case, um, I am happy to say, let me, get, let me do give some good or neutral information. Um, Birmingham is, um, I guess there's an appreciation for the majority of our officers re reflect the demographic makeup of the city if that makes any sense. So majority of officers are actually black, but even embedded in that, these officers, a lot of them grew up and were raised in the city limits of Birmingham. They went to the same elementary and middle schools. Their parents and grandparents still live in some of the same neighborhoods. And so even if that exists, there's still, there is a forever work in building trust between police and black people. That's just period. Um, and so I'm gonna get into policy. I'm gonna get into policy in a minute, but I do wanna add one other note on this topic is that we have had two police shootings in the last, since Easter, but both times, uh, a, a person shot at our police first and our police officers responded. And so even with that, in the context of what happened in Columbus, Ohio, in the context of what happened outside of Minneapolis recently, uh, mayors and police chiefs have been hiding behind um, this under state investigation so we can't show the tape or the video yet or the body cam. And in these two cities, that is out the window now. Whether it's a good, a clean shooting or your officer was wrong, be transparent and show the video. Yeah. All right, this is period. For us, what I have done since I've been mayor in the last year is we've now created a actual first ever in the state's history a civilian review board. 
Um, and that needed to happen. Again, that's a way to build more trust. And then I'm gonna be quiet because I know you wanna ask me a follow-up question, I believe. I'm looking at the intensity of your face. In addition to that civilian review board, we had a task force to look into our policies and procedures and make recommendations to the chief and I. So we continue to hold ourselves accountable. What I've told my chief is, I don't wanna be in a reactionary mode. We have to lead on reform. It can't just be when an officer does something wrong. In addition to that, we should publish and show our officers discipline. If you put them on leave without pay, if they've been terminated, whatever it is, you have to show the community people are being disciplined so they know we're holding our officers accountable, even separate from the Citizens Review Board we just created. So that's just a little bit. I appreciate that. I'm going to ask you one more question before I move yeah. on to Mayor Kurt Tony. One of the things that we've learned is that um, for some, uh, some critique you for not taking seriously or engaging around on the movement kind of proposals. Um, what do you say to what do you say to people who say we should be thinking about how to funnel so, resources into social services, et cetera? How would you respond? So one is please allow me as mayor to walk and chew gum at the same time. It can't it can't be either or and this is, this is the most important thing. I want everybody to really understand what this because I'm not gonna BS y'all pulling the punches. I'm just gonna give it to you straight. Every police department is not created equal. So comparing police departments is apples and oranges when it comes to our budgets. It's not a matter of taking away from this department to give over here. So what does that mean? When you look at Minneapolis size of their police department, uh, prior to the George Floyd uh, being killed. They had roughly, I wanna say about 900 and, no, about 890 officers, something there in that ballpark. We had about 903. So on par, that's literally the same amount of officers. Their police budget was about 150 million. Our police department budget was only 93 million. So the same amount of officers, but their budget is almost double what our budget is. Yeah. So when they say defund the police, in Minneapolis, they're being literal, defund the police. Our police department, literally 94% of the entire budget is personnel, benefits, wages, salary. If you want me to defund the police, what you're also telling me is I have to fire police. I'm not in a position to do that because the generations in our community don't speak the same. I go to a neighborhood meeting, I go to a church, I go to a corner store. The number one request is, Mayor, I want either more police or more police presence. So what the citizens request are aren't the same, even if the volume of those are saying deep on the police is louder. Here's what we're gonna do in Birmingham. We're gonna keep our police funding level and we're also gonna provide money for social services. I couldn't do that last year because in the middle of all this conversation, my tax base is a regressive sales tax. So I couldn't just find money, I couldn't print money like the federal government and just take money from the police and put it in social services. But this year with the, with the additional resources, we can keep our police funding flat because we're not gonna fire any officers. And at the same time, we're gonna put money in social services. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so one, one thought, and I do wanna bring Mayor Curtoni in at this point too. Hi, Mayor. Um, so it, I can hear you, but there's a background noise, so it makes it, it, makes it a little fuzzy. I apologize and I've been losing connection. So I'm gonna do my best to answer this question. However, I am gonna move. So please excuse me if I, I turn off my camera afterwards to go find another spot. My deepest apologies to you and everybody participating and in, involved in this meeting. One. No, no problem. Um, um, yeah, so I'm interested in, in, in having you speak to the same question, um, Mayor Kirk, Tony. Sure. That is about the quality sure. of the relations between police agency and residents of color in your community. I will give you, the best answer from my perspective, it would not be an accurate one because I can't speak for a person of color, a black person, a brown person, an indigenous, and every immigrant in the city. 
A simple answer is from where we were when I came into office and we reformed the police department, as you mentioned, the opening, much better. Because, and you know, and I do want to answer this in thinking about where our efforts were at the beginning, where most public officials default to is focused on the individual, the operations, the staffing, and how we respond. Uh, a little background, I, I was a criminal defense lawyer for 10 years before I became mayor. I was a public defender. Um, I've seen how the firsthand how the criminal justice system feels on the war on drugs, the field of war on drugs, uh, policing, bad cops, you name it. And if I fired and forced retirement of any one employee sector more than the other, it's been in the public safety. I will say this, I'm really proud of the men and women of some of the police department and what they've done over the last 18 years with the work that started under, along with the former attorney general and the community to transform some of what was known when I took office as the house of hate by the Boston Globe to uh, eventually being kind of nominated the former chief Dave Bell and being nominated to former President Obama as a champion for change. Um, we've worked over the years, individually officers to not measure success by arrests, by how many by how many contacts they made with newcomers, immigrants, our youth, businesses, the youth dialogues with a local organization called Team Empowerment that works to institute social behavioral change led by young people. And I see all that work to be a model of progressive community-based policing. That being said, as proud as I am in that, and it can be held up on many great examples of what we need to do, I'll be the first to admit and call out that policing in general not the officers, although there are a lot of bad ones in that demand profession. I'm not going to get, not saying that in a minimizing way, uh, but I'm, I'm going to speak to how proud I am the men and women in our department. But policing in general as a structure is built on a foundation that is not just inequitable, but racist. We know that. Uh, anyone who's worked and paid attention to the criminal justice system knows that. You can only reform that so far. So as much as I am excited about, happy about the reform of crowd, I'm excited about the opportunity as we get into think about what does it mean to reimagine? And that being said, so yeah, I, I would say that overall people say it's a lot better than it was 20 years ago, but I, you know, if, unless you've been on the wrong end of the criminal justice system and the way it, the scale has been tipped against, not people like me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a white, self-proclaimed, progressive, anti-racist, white ally, who grew up in some of them, but, uh, and, you know, from the clients I've represented, the friends I've had who grew up in the city who were on the wrong side of that and, 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 and saw that pain firsthand, um, you know, I, I can't speak for them. I think that that is better, but the, it's the system until the system is completely, not just rethought and reformed, but until we think about what policing should be and how it should service the community and figure that out together, we're not going to get to that we're not going to get to a place where everyone can be hold their head up high and say, I'm proud of a public response, a public safety response system in terms of policing. So I hope that answer makes sense. Um, I think 10 years ago, I might have said, everybody's happy with the police. Well, they might be much happier than where it was, but I would say. Oh, it looks like we lost uh, Mayor Curtatoni, and so hopefully we can get him back. Um, I, because I do want to open this up for Q and A um, soon. Um, of course, after my my uh, co organizer uh, asks his questions, I do have one question for uh, Mayor Woodfin Sheehan and Curtatoni, if we can, if and when we get him back, and that is, in, in some ways, piggybacking off of the um, comment that uh, Mayor Woodfin made, which is that his residents are asking for more police. They want greater police presence. And when I hear that, what I actually hear, and, and Mayor Woodfin, tell me if, if you disagree, is people saying that they want to feel safer. They are interested in building up their public safety systems, which could, some, I think, imagine be as a result of increasing police presence. But increasingly, we're coming to understand that there are more effective, efficient, cheaper, and less harmful ways to achieve public safety than police. And perhaps, black, including Black residents, don't realize the extent to which there are these other options that can lead to public safety, such that police, who can often be extraordinarily harmful in some communities of in communities of color. Um, that this, there, there will be better options. We've spent the, basically the better part of an academic year talking to people about these, these emerging models. So for each of you, I'd like to ask, um, to what extent can we pull apart this notion of public safety from police and imagine 
um, achieving public safety without relying so heavily um, on, on police in the way that they did, taking seriously the concerns of, of residents like your own, um, um, Mayor Woodman. Okay, so this doesn't have to be a long answer at all, but it should be very direct. I think the type of calls people respond to, the type, people make calls into our 911 systems. And maybe we should literally be giving our, maybe we should literally be training, educating, sharing, and showing our citizens if this certain type of thing exists in your home or your place of business, here is a non 911 number to call so someone outside of the police can respond to. I mean, that's the shortest but most direct answer I can give is. I, there are situations like, like domestic violence that require police, but if a person has a mental health issue, and let's say they're mad that they, somebody's, a family member is withholding their funding or something like that, maybe a non-officer should respond. However, some would also say maybe an, if the person is willing to die, maybe an officer should at least clear the scene first, but also on that scene have a mental health professional with them. Here's the deal, right? Whoever else is responding to that call, that calls money as well. So when people say defund the police, what they're also saying is, hey, maybe non-officers should be responding to certain calls. I can guarantee you this as a mayor, and the other two mayors will tell you, the non, the, whoever this professional person is, if it's not in-kind services through a nonprofit where people volunteer their time, it's going to be a significant amount of resources the city would have to come up with because once you start something like that, you can't stop it. So I think it's going to require like collective partnership uh, with our for-profits, our foundations, and our nonprofit organizations if we don't have the resources. Um, this federal money is one time. Or if citizens not willing to raise taxes on a certain thing, I definitely don't want to do that. Can we pull resources together? You know how we have volunteer lawyers to do certain things on behalf of people? Is there a volunteer pool uh, to give of their time for certain calls that go out to either go with an officer, officer make sure the scene is safe and then allow that person to approach or an officer doesn't show up at all and allow some type of mental health expert to go and respond to this call. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I certainly can't say that I understand the pressures that you're under, but as you respond, I'm reminded of the CAHOOTS program, which is much cheaper <laughs> and ends up saving the police money because they divert people away from jails, they divert people away from emergency rooms. And in the end, the police force, uh, the, the budget is much less impacted because they're not um, relying so heavily on police, but it also reduces the impact on other uh, major services in the, in the community, including emergency rooms. So it ended up producing tens of millions of dollars of savings in Eugene, Oregon, a, a very small city, much smaller than Birmingham. And so I actually think the offsets, um, especially if you were to include the, the money associated with lawsuits, probably huge relative to um, uh, the cost of continuing as is. But I, I get that there are some complexities that I probably don't understand, but I, I, I think that there are probably more opportunities here to save um, and produce better outcomes um, than you might imagine. Um, uh, Mayor Sheehan, um, in response to this question um, about uh, alternatives, uh, alternative ways to achieve public safety, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, we're one of 14 cities right now that's um, uh, working with WeWork cities on a deep dive into cahoots. And, you know, I think it's really important that we um, acknowledge the fact that we need to build an ecosystem so that, you know, like cahoots, which is centered around uh, a really strong mental health provider, you know, in many of our communities, we don't have enough mental health services as it is. And so building that ecosystem is really important. But I, you know, I do um, approach it from the position that, you know, the, the, we're down 56 police officers right now in the city of Albany. And I think that that adds to the strain and the, the stress that we have right now in our city. It's really challenging. So why, why replace them with 56 police officers? You know, I think we need to look more creatively at what it is. Not, it's not even creativity. It's, it's just common sense, right? We're sending police officers into cl cl calls that come you know, for a landlord tenant dispute, 
Um, yeah. You know, uh, for my child is out of control. Um, you know, these are the for for a person, uh, you know, disturbing, which oftentimes means that, you know, there's somebody who is overdosed or who, you know, is, is struggling with mental health issues. They're not going to harm anyone. And so, you know, I think that this is a really great opportunity. Um, you know, we're working with our county. We're really trying to get up to speed because we just have to, you know, we have the resources and, and this is something the community wants. Um, it was one of the top priorities that came out of our policing collaborative and, you know, we're full speed ahead working on it as we speak. Thank you for that, um, Mayor Sheehan. Are there other uh, initiatives afoot to, to kind of balance things out in such a way that there's less of a reliance on police um, and perhaps more effective approaches to deal with the issues that, um, that your residents face? Besides cahoots, I, cahoots I, I love that model. I think it's amazing. Are there other approaches that your city, that you are uh, undertaking? In, in Albany? Yes. So, um, so certainly, I mean, you know, we're also really looking at, um, at what the needs are that, that drive many of the concerns that we have in our community. Um, you know, we still do not have uh, uh, services that are really providing for our families in a holistic way, um, whether that's access to jobs, access to childcare, or access to quality housing. Um, quality housing is a really big challenge in our city. And we actually just recently introduced uh, legislation um, that we're, we'll be the first city in the state to have um, a good cause eviction law in our city um, because we need to hold our landlords to higher standards. Um, you know, the stress and the strain that happens when families are evicted, um, you know, is, is measurable. We see it, um, the disruption that that causes to children and to their learning. Um, and living in substandard housing is in itself, uh, you know, a form of abuse. And so, uh, you know, I feel very strongly about that legislation. I'm hoping that it will pass um, as written. There's been a lot of pushback from landlords, uh, but we worked a lot with people in the community to make sure that we understood the challenges that they were facing and make a commitment that we want to be part of the solution, not part of the cycle of the problem that, uh, you know, causes stress and, and, uh, trauma, uh, particularly in communities where there has been a lot of disinvestment. Thank you so much, um, Professor, uh, Professor Mayor Sheehan. And so, Mayor Carter Tony, what, what uh, in the most progressive city in Massachusetts, what efforts are afoot to achieve public safety without such a heavy reliance on police? Oh, you're. Can't. You're you're muted, um, Mayor. That one's on me. I apologize. Otherwise, I apologize for my overall technical difficulties. So, look, we are. There are a lot of examples in cities across this country, around the world, where. Okay, so we will wait um, until, well, as we wait for Mayor Curtitoni to get back online with us, how about I hand things off to my um, co-organizer, Chris Winship, who might have questions for the mayors? Sure, thanks, Sandra, and thanks to the three mayors for joining us today. Um, I have just one question. So uh, a lot has been written in the press about uh, the problems with police unions is that obstacles to police reform. And I'm just wondering what the experience for each of you has been in your city with uh, police unions and uh, as either supporters or resistors of reform. Well, I mean, I can talk about that. I mean, I think that, um, you know, unions are a part of, of the problem, you know, the, the union contracts and the safeguards that exist in those agreements. But I think every state is different in New York state um, we have something called the Taylor Law, and that um, uh, prevents us from making uh, changes to our union contracts, and it also mandates that we go to arbitration, and an arbitrator decides our contract if we aren't able to negotiate a contract. And so, you know, that creates many challenges. You know, the, the, um, our, you know, our current police chief has been here for three years. He has fired five police officers. 
he's suspended uh, more than a dozen. And uh, you know, there is a, um, a procedure that we have to go through with every one of those disciplinary actions. And you know, as I said, you know, we recently received a incredibly racially biased arbitration decision that is not appealable, uh, that is mandating that we uh, take an officer back who we don't believe uh, reflects the standards that we have in this department um, and the expectations that our community has of our officers. So it's, it's more complicated than just the union contract. Um, it is also about uh, you know, state laws that uh, are, are barriers to being able to uh, negotiate um, uh, uh, what, what our community is demanding from an accountability standpoint. Um, and so that accountability is, is key. And, and you know, uh, in, in this recent incident that, that just happened, um, you know, I wanna stress uh, law enforcement uh, officers who covered their badge and violated uh, our city policies will be disciplined. Um, and we owe that accountability to our residents. Uh, but this is, um, it, it's challenging work. I'm pleased that New York State has chosen to repeal a law that precluded us from even disclosing disciplinary actions against our police officers. Now we can make those uh, disciplinary actions public. And we are also in the process of putting to our voters changes to our community policing review board that would allow our community policing review board to have subpoena powers and also to um, recommend disciplinary actions against our officers. Um, you know, it, 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 the time has come for accountability and I support those actions and I support um, uh, the, the legislation that uh, I hope is, is adopted by our voters. Mayor Curtitoni is back in the room and so I would <laughs> love to get him um, back in the conversation. I, I'm so sorry, Mayor, that this is happening. <laughs> it's on me and I owe you an answer. I'm gonna to try to connect the previous question to this one. I was, I was about to say that there, there are a lot of great examples around the world and best practices within the individually that have impact in the department, whether it's, you know, the cahoots program you mentioned, um, or what we've done in some of to train any officer for mental health intervention, as we all grew up to know, police would rouse homeless people. When I grew up watching that, rather than understand that the person is suffering from a, a health, a, you know, a health impediment or treating someone who's an addict not as a criminal, but as someone who has a disease, addiction is a disease. So, uh, or to do, you know, embed social workers like we did on a department that others have. But I wanna say this because I think it's important in this whole conversation. This work is a hugely adaptive challenge for everyone and everyone has to be part of it. It can't be a mayor like me or anyone else or someone in government patting themselves on the back saying, well, we, we formed the department 20 years ago. It's a lot better place. Yeah, it is. but. We, it's not tackling the status quo. It's still built upon the status quo. And if we learned anything in the last year, I hope we've seen that how the system, the status quo has compounded a system that has caused black and brown people or people with poor projected health comes to get sicker at higher rates and die at higher rates the rest of us. Those are the people who are not working the white collar jobs are going to work remotely. Those are the people who don't have equitable access to transportation. And in the midst of that pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed, and so many and countless other speaks to the whole system. So what are some of the things when you mention cahoots and this whole adaptive challenge? How about some simple things? I was taught as a defense lawyer, we'd argue before a judge, if my client could get three meals a day, have a roof over their head, a genuine opportunity for a job, that's one way we can keep them out of the court system. We as mayors, as policymakers, as the local levers, I, I mean, I see my responsibility. Um, I'm trying to understand and ask why, what should I be doing as a white ally and anti-racist, but as a policymaker of a city that is really a collection of this complex ecosystem, we impact that system. And we have a responsibility on the jobs, so on the housing, on, so many, on education. We've done that in some of all collectively with if you see, we have, a, we have a working group on our schools and our students and treating and educating the whole child, but we bring in health experts, public safety experts, guidance counselors. So it is a collection of things. We are not going to have the impact. Now, the things we've talked about, the examples, whether it be embedding social workers or the cahoots program or demilitarizing police, which we should be doing. Those are important things. But until we put the work at the center and bring the voices who've been closest to that pain 
throughout generations to own that work with us and people like me in this position support them with resources and political support and asking what is my role and what I should be doing, we're not going to have the sustainable reform necessary. And in terms of unions, I to that to, to get to the last question because I owe you this. I've had you know, I've battled unions throughout the years, um, and and it's not a surprise because they have been empowered by those at the state and other levels of government that, that have really compounded the status quo and refuse to reform it. I know Mayor Sheehan mentioned something that I've had to deal with. You know, it's been one of the hardest things to do is fire a police officer in Massachusetts. That hasn't stopped us. I know it hasn't stopped Mayor Sheehan and others because we'll go the distance um, because we need to bring accountability or else we erode or don't build any trust or credibility with the public. But we need to have that sustainable reform. And to do that, we need not just the elected body, those with transactional authority, but the public. And in our work in reimagining leases and bringing the racial and social justice director on board and creating that department is to put that work in the Senate and bring those voices to lead it with us supporting it. And yes, the men and women in blue, and there are a lot of good ones in our city who want to be part of it because the ones who want accountability want to be safe. And we're asking them to go out. They want to be, they want to be part of the work they do. They do. They love serving the community. Uh, and if we don't include them in this work, then we'd, we're embarking on this journey from one shore to the other, and we're leaving them behind. To be sustainable, all allies and stakeholders, no matter whether police officers or not, who they are in the community, have to own it with us. Can I quickly, quickly ask, do you think the new uh, mass legislation and creation, particularly of a post commit, committee that's going to be two-thirds civilians is going to help in getting uh, officers I think, fired? I, I think I, I mean, I want to credit the Black and Latino caucus leaders in, uh, here in, in, in state government, led by Anna Presley or Rachel Ron, and so many others at the, at the state house. And we, in, the, in the state, did some really good work. I submit, however, one of the problems, is, there's a few problems. Uh, one, there has to be independent, let's go to the technical piece here, independent oversight and overview of any police misconduct. In Massachusetts, I will tell you, the biggest problem that lies in the district attorney's office. I've had a battle, our district attorney, on punting, supporting the city and removing bad officers. Um, and that is a problem. There is a inherent conflict, especially in the counties between the DA's office, the assistant district attorney, the other one, police officers, investigators. And, and we don't have to go into it here, but I would tell you, there's a big issue. There needs to be independent oversight and authority to act on police misconduct. That is one. I think a lot of the work that's been done is good, really good. I really like it. I don't love it because I don't think we've got far enough. Mayor Woodfin, unions in Birmingham. Please forgive me, um, Christopher. I repeat that question so I can make sure I get my answer right. As you've uh, produced, you know, work on police reform, I'm kind of wondering sort of what your experience has been with the police unions in your city? You know, it's, it's been one that was mostly cooperative and I'll tell you why. I was a prosecutor for the city for eight years. Um, I interacted with a lot of our officers um, prior to being mayor. And so the current union president is an officer that I serve on the pension board with. And our interaction has been one of, I'm very candid with him. I try to give him information in advance. And I, um, his, our expectations are the same. Don't try to kill me and bury me in front of the media, go to war with me. We're gonna disagree on things, that's okay, but let's talk it out. Um, I literally stood before the union, the union hall, the fire, the police union, for two and a half hours, three Mondays ago. And we went through a litany of issues. Um, and part of that is, these are the reform efforts I have to do and here's why. You all have a toughest time as I have as mayor. You all are complaining that there are not enough officers, but the national conversation has hampered our ability to recruit um, because you know it's just hard to recruit right now for anybody's police department based on a sentiment in the, in the, nas the national conversation. So if you want more people to sign up to be officers, the reform measures actually help you because it's not only building trust, uh, but people in the community need to know we're doing everything to help them, um, um, protect them, not help them, but protect them. And so in order to do that, um, there's no desire to fight with the union. The reform efforts actually help you out. Thank you. 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 Thank you
So um, overall, it's good. Thank you very much. Let's open it up to questions, Sandra. Yeah, let's open it up for questions because there's so many comments in the chat. We won't use that as the way to, to identify those who have questions. Why don't you raise your hand, use the raise hand function um, and, and we will call on you and allow you to ask your question to the mayors. So Mike, why don't you ask your question to the mayors? Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you all so much for this forum. I, I guess I, I want to ask what efforts are being made to transition police officers into other forms of training or support services? Because I think there's sort of this <clears throat> unimaginative argument to be frank, that by getting rid of the police or becoming police or leaving people unemployed, but that doesn't have to be true, I mean, while I understand that there's a lot of budgetary complexity there, it's something worth exploring. Um, and so I'm curious what's being done to transition police to other roles um, that don't require sort of violent practices that police use. Um, and then secondly, I, I think there was a bit of dodging of questions by the mayors. I think there are a few points where it was asked, what do you provide beyond policing for other services of safety? And sort of instead we're on a tangent about what's currently missing, which wasn't the question. And we'd love to hear more about what alternative services you provide. Thank you. And that's open to all the mayors. Thank you so much, Mike. Mike, I guess I can go first because I'm always, I try to be short with my answers. We actually provide a litany of other services through, um, I guess our commitment is finan financial. We support nonprofits, boards and agencies that do the social work through our CDBG funding, as well as our direct general fund to serve our money. Um, we support a litany of organizations um, from issues dealing with homelessness, um, issues dealing with um, um, some a small portion of mental health. There's not enough funding getting it from the state and it's very expensive. In addition to that, um, a litany of educational services we provide. Um, so for example, we've made, we've criminalized people who don't, Nationwide, we've criminalized people who get behind the wheel of a car who don't have a license. Um, but it turns out a lot of people can't read, and so they are unable to get their license. And so we actually have a program that engages people. Uh, if they do get a, a ticket, um, literally walking them through the process, assisting them, onboarding them to actually get their license, and we reduce, we dismiss the case in exchange for them going through the program to get their license, because we acknowledge a lot of people trying to get from point A to B to take care of their family, or point A to B, which is home to a job, job back to home. And if you can't get a license, then you can't get insurance, can't get insurance, can't get a tag. And so it's a bad cycle. So that's just an example, right? Something that's small, but it's pivotal because you don't want an indebtedness court. I'll leave the second part. Yeah. First part of your question to the other two mayors. I will, um, I'm happy to jump in. Is that okay? Yeah, please do. So um, on the, uh, an example of one thing we're doing in service, uh, keep it simple, I think a powerful one, it's been held up as a model for others is the community outreach and help and recovery program or COHR uh, C -O -H -R, and that's in the Somerville Police Department. Um, and what that uh, is, is it's an in-house program and it was created to uh, basically provide assistance uh, with assessment referral as an alternative to arrest, as well as a pre and post adjudication planning for individuals uh, really impacted by behavioral health. Uh, and it also provides, the core program also provides uh, free training classes to residents who wish to assist others uh, as recovery coaches and so forth. So with the help uh, between the city uh, as a whole as an organization, our different departments, the police department um, and initiatives like the Police Assisted uh, Addiction Recovery Initiative or PA, uh, we conduct classes and classes like Pathways of Recovery and Mental Health First Aid have been successful for us year after year and we offer those types of services. Uh, and those are really some models we're building upon as we think about reimagining policing. Um, in terms of what is being done, uh, I thought the other part of the question was if I heard it correctly to shift offices away from the typical response as we know, as we have taught, you know, grown accustomed to have seen as a society. Well, that's part of the, that's in the core at the center of the reimagined policing work. And, uh, and that work is gonna be owned by the community. 
and led uh, by the racial and social justice director, the first ever in the city's history, who's actually building the agency in the city and supported by uh, roughly a million dollars worth of initial investment uh, to determine what's that look like. And but that community work's always already going. We're already working with our city council on civilian oversight board. We already moved on a new uh, tear gas ban uh, ordinance in the city, working together with advocates in the city council. But it's important that we own that work together. Uh, and because I have found even the, in the short time period of this important discussion in our society, black and brown voices aren't at the forefront of that conversation. And I've been reminded, and rightfully so, to not co-opt their narrative and those voices. And it's important we do that work. It has to be deliberate. It has to include everyone and giving them an authentic, authentic opportunity to include as we think about reimagining policing. And we need to know what we're reimagining. Uh, if we just start policing today, well, there are services that need done today because today, sadly and tragically, we still have violent crime in our communities. We still have people uh, who are victims or survivors of domestic violence or need other services. And uh, all those voices need to be brought to the forefront. And that work is really has been launching now. And what our new Irish trade director, we're excited by the new opportunity. I think, Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to add, you know, we've got two examples that I think address your question. Um, one involves the police and one does not. Um, you know, the one that does not is, you know, looking at, at our youth and ensuring that we're doing all that we can to surround them with options and, and, and make sure that they see themselves as, um, as completing high school and as um, moving on into either the workforce or, or on to college. And so um, we designed a summer youth employment program very intentionally uh, it includes enrichment. You know, it, it has also been recognized nationally. And we asked our local university uh, to study it and to determine whether we were having the outcomes that we wanted. And what we found was that young people who participate in our summer youth employment program are 60% more likely to graduate from high school. And we have the biggest impact for kids who are in the lowest percentile of their class. So when we are able to um, get, you know, have kids participate, have these young people participate, um, surround them with um, lots of uh, great work opportunities as well as um, an immersive experience, they are seeing and making the connection between their future and staying in high school. So but, you know, but I, I don't think that's answering my question. So my question is what alternative models of safety are being enforced? And that's more answering what other methods are being done to reduce the risk of criminal activity, so to speak. But what are the safety mechanisms is my question. We, we do view those as, um, and, and our community views those as ways that we are ensuring that we are supporting the community. The other method that, you know, um, you know, our homeless individuals are often victims of crime. And we, uh, our police department works very closely. We have uh, neighborhood engagement officers who are trained to problem solve. And so when we have um, uh, individuals who are homeless, um, they will work with our community-based organizations to ensure that they are being connected to services. And it doesn't always happen right away. You know, it might be that that individual remains, um, you know, sleeping in front of a, a business and we'll work with the business owner to, to uh, ensure that we're, uh, you know, providing the space for our community-based organizations that work with the homeless to, um, to engage with that individual and, and work with them to get them housed, to get them the services that they need um, so that, you know, we're providing that support and that space um, for that individual. It sometimes takes time. Um, and, and that's an area where our police department has seen a lot of success. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so Mayor Woodfin had to jump on another meeting. He said, thank you very much for this opportunity, everyone. So we were really, um, I'm excited that he was able to join us in the end. We have four questions and I'm hoping that we can get through them. That means make your questions quick, brief. Um, and I'm gonna ask the same of our mayors. The, the first person is Mary and then Brian and then Felix and Haja was on. Um, maybe she's no longer interested in asking, but if you are, Haja, there you are. Okay, Mary, take it away. Well, um, my question is for Mayor Sheehan. 
Uh, Mayor Sheehan, on this call, you have said twice that the police officers who covered their badges at last week's attack would be disciplined. Um, however, you have not publicly made any statement besides on this call, uh, and you also have not condemned the violence inflicted by Albany Police Department against the peaceful protesters. Will you be making any sort of statement to the city beyond the statements uh, that you've made on this panel? Uh, I have made statements uh, uh, following that event. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the very first statements that I put out condemned the covering of badges. So I think we've covered it. I know that our police chief, uh, as we speak, um, which is why I uh, also am um, uh, pressed for time, but he is addressing the Common Council caucus right now with respect to those events. Okay, so I believe Brian Core, you are up. Hello, Brian. Hello, and thank you. And thank you to all the panelists for being here and participating in this. I know it's a tough topic and I appreciate your time. So my question is this, understanding both the power and limits of your roles as mayors, what is one specific change that I guess now each of you would think is necessary, but is beyond your power to implement alone, that you need to work collaboratively and get broader agreement. So one specific change you'd like to make in your policing in your community that you need, that you can't do on your own. I can, if it's okay, I'm happy to start and thank you for the question. Well, I, I don't try because there's so many of them. I want to pick a, a pick one. I want to go back to what I said before about the independent oversight, because the others, at, when we think about reimagined policing, undoubtedly and inevitably there'll be collective bargaining impacts, but we'll get there to those. It's not something I, we can do, anyone can do on their own, but it's just necessary work and engagement. And as long as we're persistent, like we just finally took us five years to negotiate and we had, we held steady to get body cams uh, approved in the contract and, and that negotiation. So, but to me beyond that, it's, it's really, it's either the oversight I mentioned before or the, uh, the um you know um, um the um the immunity piece uh which uh, you know we uh, you know we really need to have leadership at a higher level of government but if i could have my choice right now it's really the the independent uh, review and investigation and prosecution of police misconduct yeah I, you know i think that that probably um you know i would have to say being able to have a police chief and a command staff who uh, is making decisions about discipline um, and, and able to, to create the department with accountability that our residents are asking for and demanding is critically important. And um, that is something, it, you know, it is incredibly frustrating um, when uh, those decisions are made to hold police officers accountable. And we have a system here where an arbitrator uh, can can overturn that decision, and I think that it it, um, it it really is a is a challenge to being able to move forward um, uh, with making changes to the department that the community are demanding. All right. Thank you both. Thank you, Brian. Felix. Hello, everybody. I appreciate your time. I'll try to be quick. Sorry, my camera actually uh, died after a year of too much Zoom, and so I will not be able to share my face. Um, so I think hearing uh, you guys and others respond to questions about why it is hard to make substantial change in terms of policing and redirect resources to other kinds of public safety investments, I think two things come up very often. Um, one is sort of this issue of unions and the fact that it's very hard to make unilateral decisions, even as a chief of police or a mayor. Um, as somebody who is in unions, has been in unions, I was actually in a civilian union in a police department, our level of protection was not what was afforded to police. And so I think it's something outside of unions um, themselves, right? Being a member of the National Association of Government Employees is very, very different than being a member of the Fraternal Order of Policing. So I'd just be curious, number one, like, what is it besides unions? Because unions as a bulwark against sort of employment, um, um, negative employment outcomes are just, it's not generally the case, it's been my experience. The other thing that comes up a lot is crime. Like people actually do care and worry about safety, violent crime, murder, you know, rape, these are real things that need to be responded to. Um, one thing that I find, I guess, hard to wrap my head around is I understand that underlying concern, but the sort of idea that that then means that policing needs to sort of remain the way it is, or that policing has been effective so far in limiting those kinds of things. I guess I'm curious what you're basing that 
that um, sort of link between. I think there's a lot of evidence um, that, you know, violent crime has increased and decreased nationwide in ways that aren't really, you know, driven by policing and what police specifically do. And so if there's any evidence that you can point to about like the effectiveness of your police department over time or sort of the investments paying off in a clear way, like our murder clearance rates, very high, our yeah. sort of rape kits, you know, being tested and the clearance rates for those kinds of crimes high, is it effective? Or is there like, if not, and if that evidence doesn't exist, why is that sort of seen as the reason why we can't um, make these kinds of changes? Thank you. I, I like to stop because uh, first, I don't, I don't see it as a reason, as a roadblock to changes. And I do not believe and I would have these arguments in public with my former police chief. And when I, I underscore and bold letter in the high and the biggest font, uh, former police chiefs and commanders who would stand up in public said, if the mayor would give us uh, 10 more offices, we can solve the BNEs. No, you can't. Uh, and what solves crime is, I, I'll go back to the very simple slogan that was stated to me over the years and many others. Let's be people. Let's give them housing. Let's give them services. That in some of those Stumble's been a sanctuary city since the late 80s, and our crime's down well over 60%. In the last 20 years, I brought our administration as a community, we've, we prioritize those social services. It's not increasing the number of staff or police officers that's going to drive down or prevent murders or, or these other crimes from happening. Uh, that is much more complex problem that we need to solve as a side, but we know how to do it. Um, so I want to make sure I'm clear in terms of my uh, point in that. Um, I, I probably in my discussion, I apologize, didn't get your whole question, but I don't see it as a barrier, never have, never will. I, I'd submit that, you know, we're going to need uh, some semblance, and we don't know what that is until we, and at least in some of all, until we do the work around reimagining what of what we know as policing today that we've come accustomed to stays the same. And what that we've done that shows promise or is promising around the world that it should be part of our response rather than a uniform officer. I mentioned something before. We've certainly and definitely since 9-11, become a military, well, uh, very well militarized society and policing has taken the form on steroids that, you know, we're going to, you know, march down and command the streets and take control. And that's not how you build trust. So I would just say, and going back to our work we did in the last 20 years, we pushed away from that approach. You know, we put an emphasis on that social intervention, uh, doing the mental health training and intervention, the core programming, being embedded in our schools, working collaboratively with partners like Teen Empowerment uh, to do youth dialogues. Our greatest uh, valley of mistrust was between our, our youth and our city and the police department. The evidence we have that that, that has gotten better is from the youth themselves and the surveys we've done over the years. But that is a great example and data we should use to launch or to help us launch as we think about reimagine police and where it should take us. Um, so I just want to make sure in terms of where I come from, I'm not going to once uh, support any argument that's saying, you know, having more police, uh, it will prevent murders. Uh, that's not true. Yeah, you know, I agree, you know, uh, Mayor, one of the things that uh, the chief who was here when I first became mayor said was that, you know, uh, the safety of a community really, you know, and, and, and police rely on compliance, right? I mean, if everybody decided that they were going to drive 100 miles an hour on the highway, um, there, you know, there's nothing the police are going to be able to do. You can't throw enough police at that issue. Um, you know, so that is wh why trust is so important, right? We, we have to ensure that um, we're creating a community where, um, where, we, where we have trust. And that trust is, is clearly not there right now in my community. Um, and we have to work towards how do we rebuild it? Um, and how do we uh, ensure that, you know, the, the, the legitimacy of the police department is created and, and exists because of the public. That's what creates the legitimacy. And so we have to work together to create policing that is legitimate to the community that lives here in the city of Albany, our residents, what they want, what they are looking for um, from their police department. Uh, but, but I agree, I don't think there's, you know, when you see where we've had big reductions in, in crime, it's, it's happened for a whole host of reasons because of improvement in social services, because of better access to jobs, because of, of, of a whole host of things um, that, that contribute to that. So, um, you know, I, I, I believe that we, sh we, you know, our goal should be to get to a place where we have as few police as possible and as, as many, um, you know, uh, community-based organizations and, and community assets and, and community resources as our community wants and needs. 
Thank you very much. Um, I, while I would love to have the final two um, folks, or now three folks who would like to ask questions, to be able to ask their questions, we have kept the mayors longer than we asked them to stay. And of course, they have um, other commitments that they have to fulfill. So we will have to say goodbye. And I apologize to the folks who didn't get a chance to answer, uh, uh, ask their questions. Perhaps send me those questions and I will send it to the mayors and we can get responses in that way. I would like to thank the mayors for joining us today. Um, for this really stimulating um, uh, conversation um, to tackle these questions and, and um, try to uh, respond to them. Um, these are very difficult times. And these are tough issues. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy conversation to have. So I appreciate that you would come and, and engage with us in this way. Thank you so much. Um, I would also like to say to the community of folks who've been coming to, uh, to joining us over the past ac academic year, um, these past two semesters, thank you so much for, for being a part of this with us. It's been great to see you all coming back. I've been loving reading your comments in the chat. Um, I would love to hear from you about what it is that you would like to see in the fall because we will be um, ramping back up um, when the fall comes you um, have made this so worth doing. Uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate the insights that you offer, the great questions that you ask. Um, and I, I, I think I can uh, um, safely say that Chris is with, with me, that this has been a pretty incredible experience. And I so appreciate that you all have been a part of it. And I hope that you join us again in the fall when we get started again. Um, mayors, good evening. Um, um, be well. Um, to our community, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to seeing you again in a few months. Thank you, Sandra. Thank